Everybody hear me okay? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're so happy to have you this beautiful Friday morning. My name is Allie Lord. I'm the Director of Community Outreach at Treasure Coast Food Bank. And I'm very excited to introduce to you a great lineup of panelists today. They play a vital role in our shared mission to end hunger and food insecurity on the Treasure Coast. As you know, today you'll hear from our panel about the importance of community partnerships, specifically how our collaborations have strengthened our ability to serve our neighbors. We will also walk you through how agencies can partner with us in the eligibility requirements for becoming part of our community work. So we'll go ahead and get started with introducing our first panelist. We have Krista Garafala. She is our Chief Strategy Officer she, um, here at Treasure Coast Food Bank. Krista has been a driving force behind our strategic initiatives, including our community partnerships and program expansion. Today, she will provide an overview of our network, our history with Feeding America, and how we enhance our programmatic outcomes through collaboration with local emergency food organizations. Please join me in welcoming Krista Garifala. Thank you, Allie, for that very, very nice introduction. <laughs> um, uh, thank you all for being here this morning. My name is Krista Garfull. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer. I've been lucky enough to be at the Food Bank for almost 15 years. Um, so I've been here for um, a good amount of the expansion that we have done for our programs. When I first started here, we only had about three, and now we have over 20. So I'm really excited to talk to you guys about some of the work that we do and how some of you, if you're not already involved in partnership, can get involved with us. So let me make sure if I get this thing. All right. So just a little history about our network. We are a member of Feeding America, um, which is the largest hunger relief uh, network of food banks um, throughout the entire United States. We have about 200 different food bank partners. Um, that we work with as, uh, you know, sister food banks. Um, so we collaborate with them um, across the state as well through Feeding Florida, our state association, but also nationally. So we have a cohort of people that are doing a lot of the same work as we are in different parts of the country that we can rely on and talk to about best practices, um, different things that they are doing in their communities that we can replicate here if, this, if the situation um, is similar um, and it's a good strategy to employ throughout our service area. Um, and that network also includes our agency partners. Um, we have about 300 agency partners in our service area, which includes um, St. Lucie, Indian River, Martin, and Okeechobee counties. And those agencies um, uh, do a number of different types of um, response in the community. We have our traditional emergency food organizations, um, what you probably know of as uh, food pantries and soup kitchens, but we also have um, organizations and programs that work with us on nutrition education, case management, um, uh, job training and skill development, as well as um, a number of other different types of programs focusing on children, seniors, families. Um, so we have a wide array of partners, but we are also always looking for new partnerships and um, different ways to expand our reach um, and reach as many people in need as possible. So our, um, our, our agency, Sorry, our agency program partners, um, like I said, run the gamut of soup kitchens, food pantries, um, child nutrition programs, which you'll hear about later, uh, senior programs, uh, different mobile distributions in the community, um, aside from our fixed locations with our food pantries and soup kitchens. Um, so we have lots of different types of ways that we partner with people. Having a variety of partnerships allows us to serve more people and, and be able to serve the need in our community. Um, we can't do this alone. Um, we're, we're a pretty large organization. We cover a pretty good um, service area in the, in the local community, but we know that collaboration and partnership is the key to us really being able to serve the needs of our community. Um, work with people on the local level and really um, come to people where they are and find solutions to really help them get back on their feet. So um, by partnering with us, agencies can expand their capacity to serve 
um, whether it's by providing food assistance or additional support services alongside of food. We also have a number of partners that, um, in addition to providing food, uh, provide some non-food items, hygiene products and cleaning supplies and um, feminine hygiene products and things like that. So there's a lot of different ways that you can be partnering with us and some of that does go beyond food. Um, but before we talk about partnership details, let's talk a little bit about basic eligibility criteria. So a minimum standard for the, um, an emergency food pantry is that you, I'm gonna just turn this over here. You have to be open a minimum of twice a month and for at least two hours each of those times. Um, that's the minimum. We always encourage our partners to be more available to the community, have um, longer operating hours so that more people can be served, but that is the minimum criteria. Um, you also have to um, go through pretty extensive food safety and handling training. Um, we need to make sure that when you receive the product from us that you are storing it properly, that you're handling it properly, um, you're doing temperature checks, you're making sure that everything is safe to be distributed to people in our community. Um, so we do work with you on um, providing that guidance on how to set up your pantry, or um, how, if, you, if, you, if you just started your pantry, how to um, incorporate that into your everyday practices um, in running your pantry. Um, the other important thing is fair and transparent distribution. Um, it's very important to us and many of our partners that we work with at Feeding America, the USDA, that um, everybody has a chance to come to your distribution. Um, one of the things that we look for people to do is, that's a, a requirement, is that you have to have a sign up at your location available to the public that says when your hours are so that people are absolutely aware of when you're open and when they can come and visit your pantry. Um, there's no preferential treatment at the distributions. Um, there can't be certain things set aside for certain people. Um, everybody has an equal chance to show up and um, provide the information that is required um, to receive food assistance and be able to receive that, that food. Um, so that's a really important part of partnering with us as well. And then um, the other thing that we really <laughs> look for is program reporting and data. Um, we, in order for us to continue doing the work that we do, we have funders, we have community members and leaders, and we have a lot of people that want to see the results of that work. They want to see who we're serving. They want to see how many people, but also the different age ranges that we're serving. Are we, are we serving um, seniors? Um, are we serving a lot of households with children? Um, are there pets in the household? Are there veterans in the household? So part of the commitment to being a partner with us is um, doing monthly reports, um, making sure that you're submitting them in a timely manner every single month um, so that we can look at that data, use it to report back to funders, be able to get more support to be able to support the pantries and the soup kitchens even more. Um, but also to take a look and see how you're performing and see if there's things that we maybe need to talk to you about in terms of making improvements or um, things that you're doing outstanding that we want to talk to you about because we want to see how you're doing it so we can talk to our other partners about how they can implement those things. Um, so we do require a monitor at least once a year for all of our food pantry and soup kitchen partners. Um, it's a time when we come out and we make sure that everything in our partnership agreement is being adhered to. Um, that includes um, checking your pest control records to make sure that you're doing all of the things you need to do to keep the food safe. Um, doing a site inspection, making sure that all of the food that you have is at least six inches off the ground, making sure that you don't have any chemicals that you utilize um, uh, on a shelf above food. Um, so we wanna adhere to all of the best safety practices, um, and we need to make sure that that is happening. It's also an opportunity for us to find out from you what are your goals, what are the things you're doing really, really well, what are the things you're struggling with that you might need help with. Um, it's not just a punitive aspect of the partnership. I know sometimes a lot of our partners do get nervous when we tell them we're coming out there, and we're like, we're not here to 
come and surprise you and, and find all of the nitty gritty things, we wanna be there to help you. Um, we wanna be there to guide you. So if we're seeing you at least once a year, although we do try to keep in contact much more than that, um, at least once a year we're checking in with you and seeing how you're doing and also seeing, like I said, are there different ways that we can collaborate? Are there resources that you could utilize in order to expand your efforts? Um, and that's when a lot of those conversations will take place, so. So the steps to partnership, um, the biggest, um, most important step is go to our website, stophunger.org, and fill out an application. And a lot more detailed um, requirements will be listed on that page, different paperwork that we'll need. There'll be some detailed questions about um, how are you running your pantry? Do you have a budget in order to help sustain the pantry? Um, you know, there'll be a lot more um, questions on there. Um, but if you go to stophunger.org and you go to, there is a section on the top that says partner agency portal. Um, if you click the drop down, it says become a partner agency. And that is where you will see a whole bunch of different details about the criteria that we have for um, all, a lot of the things I went over here, but a little bit more detail. The documents that are required for you to submit with your application. And then once you submit everything, um, someone on our team will give you a call. They'll review the application. If there's things that are missing or maybe there's things that we need a little bit more clarity, we'll work with you. Um, if you are going through the application, bless you, um, and you have questions um, and you submit it and you send it to us and you're like, I wasn't sure about number three and number four, someone will reach out to you. We, we want you to be successful. We want to expand partnerships. So we will go through a lot of these processes with you so that we can make sure that um, you know you are set up for success, that our partnership will thrive and um, we can learn as much as we can about you um, in order to um, begin a collaboration. So once all of that happens, there will be, um, you have to attend a training. Once we um, have you set up and go through your application, we see that it's a good fit for partnership. There is a, um, uh, training that you we need to um, provide to you. We provide it. Um, we have all of the tools necessary that will help you understand um, what's in your agreement, what are the things that you are going to need to do on a monthly basis, reporting, uh, pest control, a lot of other different things, um, but also different things regarding um, the fair and equitable distribution at your facilities, that's where the um, civil rights training comes in. And then we also provide you with the food handling, basic food handling training. And that's for the people at the food pantry so they know exactly what they're doing and they're handling all of the food properly. Um, we also have some online training through SurfSafe um, that where you, can, where you need to get additional food handler training. And then anybody that's running a soup kitchen or any facility that's preparing meals and serving them does need to get their SurfSafe managers. Um, that's to ensure that there is somebody on staff guiding the rest of the staff in the best practices of working in a kitchen. So um, we go through all of this stuff with you. We work with you throughout the whole process. We answer any questions. If there's some barriers that come up that maybe um, we need to work with you on, we, um, we'll work with you. We'll try to find you resources. Uh, if you are a food pantry and you wanna be able to serve, um, not just have shelf-stable food available, but fresh produce, but you don't have a refrigerator, we can work with you on trying to figure out like how, how, can we, how can we help you meet that need because you want to distribute fresh, healthy food and we want to help you do that. So um, there are certain things that will come up during that process, <coughs> excuse me, that um, may be things that are a, a barrier to what you wanna do, but we try to work with you as much as possible to, um, to get you to where you wanna be in serving the community um, and being a, a partner to us. Um, so, to wrap up a little bit, um, you know, we're looking for lots of partners. We're looking to expand. If, if you are an agency, if you're a church, community agency, um, a school, uh, any, any sort of community agency that is providing services to low-income population in the community, um, our low-income neighbors and families, 
um, we want to work with you. We want to make sure that we're meeting the need and we need a lot of different partners to do that with us. So um, if you're interested in becoming a partner, please go to our website, look at the criteria that's on there. Um, and, um, it, and I just went over a lot of information for food pantry and soup kitchen, but you may be um, a better fit for another program. You're gonna hear from uh, Corbin today, who uh, oversees our child nutrition programs. Um, maybe you're primarily serving children and that's the type of program that you wanna partner with us. Um, we also have Ruby here from our um, neighbor experience team. Uh, she manages our case management, um, outreach, and information and referral. Maybe your partnership with us is letting us know what your services are so we can pass them on to other people that are coming to us for referrals. Um, so I did put up here a list of the um, partners uh, and on our team that you would be hearing from if you do submit an application and depending on which program you fit into, um, you'd be working with some of these people. So um, Samantha Cruz, our um, distribution and compliance manager, um, she's the person you're gonna deal with if you do submit an application for a food pantry, soup kitchen, any sort of emergency feeding organization. Um, Corbin Moyer, who is a program coordinator of ours. If you submit um, an application and that you're a good fit for our child nutrition programs, like our backpack, school pantry, diaper pantry, um, and our prepared meals programs for after school meals and summer feeding, you would be working with her. Um, Antonio Domofsky, who is not here, he's actually out in a mobile distribution right now. Um, if you were to, were to partner with us on any sort of mobile distribution efforts, you would be working with him. And then we have Ruby Aguirre Carnes, our Director of Neighbor Experience. If you are going to partner with us by giving us information about your services to provide to the community and help um, you know, get referrals to your programs, she would be the person that you would be working with. So um, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I hope this is gonna be helpful. You're gonna be hearing from a lot of other uh, people on our team and then also some of our wonderful partners um, who uh, collaborate with us. Um, we have uh, a partner that's been with us for a very long time, and then we have someone from a partnership that is new to us. So we thought it would be good for you guys to um, have both of those perspectives in, in learning how they collaborate with us and what they do in the community. So thank you guys so much. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much, Krista. All right, up next we have Corbin Moyer. She's one of our program coordinators here at Treasure Coast Food Bank. And Corbin plays a key role in overseeing our direct food assistance programs for children and families, including our after school meals program and the diaper pantry program. Please welcome Corbin Moyer. Hi, everyone. I'm a little taller than both you guys. I didn't think I was that tall. Um, my name is Corbin Moyer. I've been at the food bank for just about over two years. Um, I work with all the child nutrition programs, um, just like they've said. We have quite a bit of them. We're trying to expand them always. Um, children's programs near and dear to my heart. I have two very young toddlers, um, so every time I go out into the field, I have a very close feeling with all the children and, and I definitely have a big heart in the community when it comes to our children's and our families here. Um, just a couple little stats here, one in five, and this is a Florida stat, just Florida alone, one in five Florida children are food insecure and have the food insecurity in their households. Um, so it's just, that's such a large number. I don't like seeing that. We have a room of about 30 of us, so that would be six kids. That's, that just breaks my heart. Um, hunger affects children's cognitive abilities to focus in school and that's one of the big things we focused on is how can we help children within the school that they're actually in. A lot of the teachers are the ones who identify these needs. They're the ones that are in the classrooms with the students that notice the kids falling asleep, notice that a kid can't focus, kid doesn't have a snack or a lunch, sits alone, those kind of things. We rely a lot on that. Just a little bit overview of all the child nutrition programs here that we have and offer at the food bank. We do school pantries, teen pantries, diaper programs, backpack programs, after school meals for, and summer meals. A little bit about each one of them. So uh, both school pantries and teen pantries are primarily run inside of our schools. 
Um, we rely on school pantries and teen pantries to distribute not only shelf-stable food items to families and children, but also hygiene items. Our teen pantry focuses primarily on hygiene items for children. All of our middle school teachers are very thankful for those programs within middle schools. We provide things like deodorant, body wash, toothpaste, toothbrushes, those kind of things. Things that we don't think about, but things that they're not going to go home and ask mom and dad for. To focus on right now with our um, programs that are run through the Treasure Coast Food Bank, sponsored by us, ran with us, we have the school pantries, the teen pantries, the backpacks, and the um, diaper pantries. I know you hear school pantries and you think, I'm not a school, I can't be a school pantry partner, so that's out the question. It isn't. If you are an after school program, if you are a daycare, if you are any sort of program that serves kids and serves the kids in the um, neighborhoods of need, then you qualify. We have several partners that are not in schools that we label them as school pantries because they serve children. School pantries, though, however, are not just for the children, they're for the whole families. So we'd like to do school pantries because it provides food, shelf-stable food that can be brought home and then provide food to the whole entire family. Um, a little bit about school pantries, again, they're mostly inside schools right now. We work pretty closely with the school district, um, with on all the counties that we serve. But we also have some school pantries and after-school programs like YMCAs, Boys and Girls Clubs, things of that nature. We end up having school pantries there as well. Same with teen pantries. Ruby even has a teen pantry in her office. Um, again, anywhere that you're servicing children and their families, you could be applicable for a school pantry or a teen pantry. Our backpack program is a little bit more tailored to specifically the child. Our backpack program is not a backpack. It is a little pack that fits inside of a backpack. That pack is sent home with kids on Fridays. So those kids have not only food on the weekends, but food that they can prepare themselves. We don't know the environment. We don't know what kind of home life they have. A lot of these kids rely on both breakfast and lunch that are free Monday through Friday at schools. And so we wanted to alleviate that Saturday, Sunday gap where we don't know if they're receiving a meal. So our backpack program sponsors are through the school, but also they're through churches that sponsors our school. So our backpack programs, all of them are sponsored through local churches. They have a church in um, the community, they recognize the school's need, and then they sponsor the backpacks through that. We have a lovely school in Hope Sound that gets sponsored through a church. The church actually comes and they help package up bags, they bring extra fresh produce for the kids, and then the church actually distributes those bags um, within the schools to those kids every single Friday. So that's another great program, which while you're not storing product on your property, you're not distributing product on your property, but you are still a partner. You are still a partner helping our community, you're helping us, you're sponsoring the children, and you're making sure they have meals over the weekend. Another program that we have is diaper pantries. Extra close to my heart, I got two kids in diapers. I know how expensive diapers are. Diapers are not covered by WIC. Diapers are not covered by food stamps. It is a necessity that is, does not have any assistance attached to it, and they're expensive. Even with coupons, even with the store brand, they are expensive. So diaper pantries program is within more case management style programs, so like Treasure Coast Community Health, um, the Buggy Bunch over in Indian River County. Those are types of programs that run diaper pantries. You have families, moms, kids, and it's coming over for assistance. Um, they need help with housing assistance, food, but then they have that caveat of diapers where no one really thinks about it unless you are in need of diapers. Um, so our diaper pantry program is another one. We're really trying to expand there. Um, we're trying to get more people on board to help distribute those diapers to those mothers and those families that are in need. Our other, two, our other two programs here are going to be more federal and state-run programs. We have the after-school meal program and the summer food service program. The after-school meal program is a Department of Health program that we run here. Our production kitchen over on Industrial 25th preps out all of our meals. The kids will either get a hot or cold but fully prepped and fully prepared nutritious meal that they are able to eat after school. So kid, kids are growing, they grow fast and they eat a lot. So that kid will have their breakfast and have their lunch at school. They go to an after school program such as the YMCA or maybe an after school basketball camp. They're hungry there too. So we provide meals for the children there. They're able to have a meal before they go home. Um, and so that's a really nice program as well. We deliver the meals to them. Um, so they're able to distribute those meals. 
regulatory with that one. Again, it's through the Department of Health and also with um, DCF. So all of our sites that do after school meal program distribution are going to be either um, certified through the DCF or have an exemption letter through DCF. That is purely because they are servicing children under 18. So there is a, a side of regulations with the DCF that has to be there because of them being underage children. The summer food service program is similar to after school meals. It operates the exact opposite times. So after school meals is run through the school year. When the school year is not running, again, we have now a three month gap of summer where kids aren't getting their free breakfast, they aren't getting their free lunch, and parents are having them home, so they're eating even more food at home. You take an ins food insecure home that already has a hard time with groceries and now you're doubling the meals for three straight months when all their children are home. Then you add in multiple children and it becomes quite a hard three months for families to get through. So the summer food service program is run through the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Similar to AMP, there is regulations there, there's inspections there, um, but just like all of our other partner agencies, we're here to help. We're here to guide you through the steps and guide you through the processes and help you come out of this successful and serving kids, which is at the end of the day was everyone's goal with all of my programs. Uh, the summer food service program, again, it is free. It runs through all of the three months. Summer food service program has a little bit less when it comes to, I guess, regulations of what you have to have. It only runs for that three months. So if you have like a vacation Bible school at a church, if you have an after school program, if you're just a community um, center and you wanna be available for the community to come there. A lot of our partners also are libraries. We partner with a lot of the libraries in all of the counties. That's another place where kids are gonna be hanging out during summer. If parents want them out of the house, go do something. They go to a library, they're able to read books, they're in a safe environment, and then they will be able to get their free meals while they're there. For summer feeding, we both do breakfast, snacks, and lunch. So the sites can choose to do kind of one or two of them. So you can choose to serve breakfast and lunch or snack and lunch, any combination of those just to provide students and provide families their meals. Great job, Corbin, thank you so much. All right, next up we have one of our amazing partners. Um, I'm so pleased to introduce Violet Smith the office manager at Fairlawn Family Church. Violet and her team at Fairlawn have been valuable partners in our efforts to serve the Treasure Coast community. She will share her experience working with Treasure Coast Food Bank and how their organization has been able to support local families through their collaboration with us. Please welcome Violet Smith. Good morning and thank you for inviting me. Um, Fairlawn, we've been doing um, soup kitchen for four plus years. We were primarily focused initially on the homeless and it quickly grew and grew. And um, we learned rather quickly that we didn't just service the homeless. It's the elderly neighbor that can't get food it's the teenager whose mom isn't home to cook dinner for them at night. It's the underemployed family who's trying to make ends meet. It's the disabled person that can't cook a meal at night. Those are the people we serve at Fairlawn. Uh, we opened Mama's Pet's Kitchen four plus years ago. Um, it's very expensive, as you know, to buy food. <laughs> And especially when you're looking at meat sources, fresh vegetables, and we always reached out to the community to try to get donations, and, but we knew we needed to partner with Treasure Coast Food Bank. We knew that. Um, and we were finally able to do that last year, and we are t totally thankful to Treasure Coast Food Bank. Since um, we've been on their website as being a soup kitchen we've found more people coming to our facility these are people that have several different needs and when you're sitting down at a table having a meal with a person it opens conversation we serve each and every person that comes to the door we don't we have no criteria whatsoever um, we serve right now two days a week on Sunday morning and then Wednesday nights. 
We want to increase that. We just haven't been able to find the volunteers to come in and cook because it is a lot to come in and cook for a crowd of 100 people and um, being able to plan that meal. But we're working towards it and it's going to happen and we know it will happen. Um, when you're sitting down at a table, there's several things that happen. Yes, you're eating, but when you're eating, endorphins are endorsed once they hit your stomach. And when those endorphins endor activate in your brain, it then in turn creates, maybe you can tell a joke to a person, it opens you up to communication. And when you're starting to communicate with a person, you're finding out what their true needs are. They could be going through a mental health crisis that they truly need help with, and you might be able to have that word to um, encourage them to go to seek help for that issue. Um, it could be a child that has been left at home for three days. This has happened. And we've been able to reach out to that parent and say, hey, uh, you kind of need to be home or you need to let us know so that we can find a resource for this child to go somewhere. There's different things that come out in conversation over a dinner table. And our focus, we have learned, has been more towards having the conversation, tackling the tough issues that people are facing, and trying to find solutions for them. One of the things we also have at Fairlawn Family Church is we have an outreach boutique, which is amazing because we have such generous people in our community that donate items to us. There is a facility over on the island that is a seasonal area. And when the people leave, they donate all their items to Fairlawn. Everything in our outreach boutique is free. Everything. Um, we get clothes with tags still on them. We get items fresh, you know, like in a box of uh, household dishes. We only request that the people only take three outfits at a time because unfortunately we do have some hoarders in our community as well. And so we kind of have to monitor that a little bit. <laughs> And um, in the process, there's um, other things that we supply as well for them. Uh, personal hygiene items. Um, again, you were mentioning the fact that WIC does not, and food stamps do not allow the paper products or the diapers and things of that nature. Thankfully, through Treasure Coast Food Bank, we can order paper products. And so somebody's sitting there and saying, oh, I can't afford toilet paper this week. You know what? We have toilet paper for you, okay? Here, we, we got you. We got you covered, okay? And uh, we make a point of following up with these people and say, is there anything else you need? Okay, because we, we might be able to help you, okay? And some people, when they're sitting down at the table, they're thinking, oh my gosh, this is a church. These are churchy people. They're just going to sit here and talk about Jesus day and night, and I really don't want to hear it. You know what? That's not true. We do not even bring up Jesus' name in the fellowship hall. We love him, we serve him, but that's not why we're there at that moment. We're there to show our community love. And that's the message we want to get out as a church, that you are loved and you are part of our family. Whether you're smelling and haven't had a bath for three days, or whether you just need somebody to talk to. Whatever it is, we're there for you. That being said, also with the outreach boutique, there is a need in our community for laundry services. And we are, thankfully, through the partnership with Treasure Coast Food Bank, we're now able to save a little bit of money on our food resources. Quite a bit of money, honestly. <laughs> And that is so thankful and helpful to us because we can now focus on opening a laundry facility. Once we get through the city of Fort Pierce permitting, because, you know, we got to go through permitting, um, we're hoping to open up an outdoor laundry facility and shower area. We have the plans drawn up. They're in the city. 
waiting for the final approval. There's a lot of issues concerning privacy with that, but we also want it openly accessible for people because it might be 11 o'clock at night and somebody's sleeping on our sidewalk that wants a shower, okay? We want to have that accessible to them, but we also can't bother our neighbors, and we're aware of that. Um, we are also hosting our annual Thanksgiving feast this year. Um, it's open to everybody. A lot of people don't serve Thanksgiving on Thanksgiving Day. We do the full-fledged 100% Thanksgiving feast with all the trimmings. We turn the football game on and we have fun, okay? Because that's what Thanksgiving is about, is having fun and being with your family. And our community is our family and we are dedicated to our family. It took us a year, possibly, to get connected with Treasure Coast Food Bank initially. We did have to come, overcome a few little hurdles, like finding somebody to do the Serve Safe certification. Um, thankfully, we had a member of our church that is a chef that has stepped forward and says, I'll be the manager. I'm like, okay, yay. <laughs> because that's a long um, course that they do have to take. But we do have other people um, taking the course at the current time to become additional managers. We are thankful to Treasure Coast Food Bank. There are things that we get being a soup kitchen that we are unable to use. Um, being a soup kitchen, Meal preparation is a little di different than at your house, okay? Um, and when you order from Treasure Coast Food Bank, you get a box. You don't know really what's in it. The, the volunteers honestly don't know who that box is going to. So there may be items that we're not able to use being a soup kitchen, single serve items, things of that nature. Uh, those we place in a box or we place in a separate freezer. And when people come forward in need, we make a box up for them and allow them to have those items. There are some items that we just place out on the table if it doesn't require refrigeration and we let it be an open whatever. You take what you need, please. Um, because why should we hoard it? it you know? <laughs> It needs to go back to our community, and so that's what we do with all of our items. Um, we have had freezers go down and replace them. I haven't reached out to Samantha yet. I am going to be reaching out to her because I learned today that she might be able to help us with getting a freezer because we could use an extra freezer. Um, and but everything is provided through Treasure Coast Food Bank. They're ordered, we were expecting just to receive food. We weren't expecting to receive, be able to order electronics. You know how many teenagers need chargers for their phones? They lose them every single day. <laughs> they do. And they know that they, we, we have them. We have them and we hand them out readily, you know. Um, things like that, it's not just about the food. It's about the community focus. And in today's world, where people have been hurt deeply or feel like they're um, less than, for lack of a better word, it's so important to make them feel included, to make them realize that, you know what, it's okay. It's okay, we got you, okay? And we're here for you, and we're gonna cheer for you, and we're gonna find a solution to your problem, or we're gonna help you find a solution if it's homelessness, whether it's not being able to cook a meal at night, or um, nobody home with you in the evenings. We're gonna find a solution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Violet, for all you do in our community. We're so grateful for our partnership. All right, next up, we have another one of our great partners, Ms. Joan Gabran. 
Um, Joan works at the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and Joan will be sharing insights on how their church has been able to expand their services with the help of Treasure Coast Food Bank and how partnerships like this one are making a tangible difference. Please welcome Joan Gabran. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. I'm so pleased to be here to just share our experience. And um, first of all, I'll say that our church really wanted a way to make inroads in our community, to make a difference. We were looking for ways, not a way, but ways of impacting our community. During the pandemic, we started out and we, um, we started a vaccination clinic and we were able to vaccinate 1,400 individuals and then give booster shots. We had people coming in from West Palm Beach all the way up to Port St. Lucie just to get that. And that just made us feel that it is so, that there are so many things we can do. So immediately after the pandemic, when things started to open back up again, we reached out to the Treasure Coast Food Bank. And Treasure Coast Food Bank, you guys are awesome. You worked with us and pretty soon we had our pantry up and going started off small, but it grew very rapidly. And we started off, I think I remember the first pantry we ever had, we had 15 families. And now we're serving 120, 120 something families per week. We are doing six hours per month of pantry. We run, run twice a month, three hours each time. But this is not where we want to stop. And with the help of um, Treasure Coast Food Pantry, and I say these, the Treasure Coast Food Bank has been so helpful to us. They have given us freezers, to, um, fridges, refrigerators to store stuff. They have given us shelving because we we are limited for space. We need a lot of shelf shelving in a limited space we have. We have gotten help with shelving. We have gotten so much encouragement. We went to from a box pantry where we put the things in a box and hand them out to a choice pantry where the folks come in and they shop. That has been such a game changer for us. The families that come, they love it. They get nothing they don't want. Nothing gets wasted. As a matter of fact, what's happening now, they bring the stuff that they don't want that they get at other pantries <laughs> and they donate it to us. <laughs> so th th that's to tell you, when you do things that, that, that really meets needs and you meet people where they are, it makes a difference. But here's the thing, and I want any person or any individual representing any organization here this morning who wants to join the great work that Treasure Coast Food Bank is leading out in, it doesn't stop. If you open a pantry, it doesn't stop there. As I said before, we were looking for ways, ways to, um, did you have my PowerPoint up? Yeah, this one? Yeah, I got you. I'll be here quicker. Okay. <laughs> yes. So we were looking for ways of engaging with our community and the pantry was a massive opening wedge for us. Because we went from the, we, we, we started right now, we went from, as I said, 15 families to now from January to October, we served 1,560 families. And that, me, that included 1898 youth, 1,329 seniors, 3,350 non-senior average, non-senior families. So we're serving, we're, we're serving um, a, a lot of people in our, in our community. And our community is an area that is underserved by many social service agencies. Now, the next slide, please. Right. So as I mentioned, if you're thinking of doing a food pantry, don't expect it to stop there. Because the pantry opens wedges to other things. Having started done the vaccination, then we started the pantry, it was so successful, that encouraged us. So what we did, we started to do other things too. 
So we are, we are networking with community partners in you know, the second chance, the national second chance job fair. We did a job fair in April. And we had people from the pantry coming to the fair, al along with other drawing more people in from the community. We had 174 job seekers. We don't know yet quite how many people got jobs, but we know we had 85 interviews. And we plan to do this every year. Then we also did a health fair, a community fair. And we again partnered with other community organizations. Um, One Blood, we had a blood drive with the Florida Department of Health, with the um, Council on Aging, with Hans Clinic, and, and quite a few others. Um, we had some independent pharmacists coming in, physiotherapists, everything. It was successful. First time, and we expect that next time, and we plan to do this every year. So my message, next, um, next slide. It opens a door and it teaches you, you learn community networking. I'm a transplant from Tennessee, moved down here, didn't know anybody, started with a food pantry, food bank, network with the um, Florida Faith Alliance, and then with the COSA network. And now I am proud to say that I'm a partner with so many organizations, almost 200 organizations at my fingertip that we can partner. This is the exciting road that you step out on when you start a food pantry and you partner with Treasure Coast Food Bank. So, so we, we also, that didn't, we, it didn't stop there. Do you do something and you wanna do more and you wanna do more? So right now we are, we open a Florida, um, an information center. So every, every time we have an, an event at our church, whether it's a food bank, food pantry or anything, we have that information center up. And it has information on so many community resources, health resources, everything, mental health, children's services, um, assistance to families, STD, everything. So we provide, the Florida Department of Health provides us with all of this information, the brochures from all these different organizations, and we put them up. So people who come to our pantry, they have access to so many resources, information on these resources. We also, um, are, um, we also partner with the city of Port St. Lucie, and we, do, we have adopted the, um, all of Tulip Boulevard three miles and we do cleaning on that, picking up on that. So it's, it's an exciting journey. And I wanna testify that our partnership with Treasure Coast Food Bank is one of the best things we did. It will be one of the best things you do, but don't expect it to stop there. Go into that partnership expecting to expand and do more. It's just a gateway. It's just an opening wedge to much greater things. Thank you. Thank you, Joan, that was great. All right, and last but not least, we have our amazing Ruby aguirre Carnes. Um, Ruby is our Director of Neighbor Experience at Treasure Coast Food Bank, and she is deeply committed to enhancing the experience for our neighbors and ensuring that every individual and family receives the support they need. Please welcome Ruby. Thank you for the introduction, Allie. Um, I have had the joy of being with Treasure Coast Food Bank now for eight years. Um, Treasure Coast Food Bank took over the Whole Child Connection program in about 2015. I came on board one year later. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Whole Child Connection and the work we do with the community alongside our um, Your Plate office also located here in St. Lucie County. Both offices share um, a very similar mission in terms of making sure that underserved communities are connected um, to direct services that are going to kind of help improve their lives from where they are at the moment, but also the, the purpose of that is really to get them to a place of either self-sufficiency or out of a crisis. Um, 
and kind of learning about a lot of the organizations that we partner with. We don't do that work alone. Um, our whole child connection program specifically in Martin County, just to kind of give you a little bit of an overview. We have an online website where we have over 700 programs listed. Now, those aren't individual agencies. Those are programs that really center around a holistic approach for services that are available to families. It can be really difficult when you are in need of help to really kind of know where to start. That's where our whole child connection advisors come in. We have that list of resources. That website is available on our you can find it through stophunger.org backslash WCC. It's anonymous. You can submit your information there. It's a series of age-based questions. And it can be anywhere from if you have an infant, if you have a toddler, if you have a teenager. Teenagers aren't gonna need the same resources that you're gonna need for an infant. Um, but one of the things that we do is we guide the family through that profile. It is a client choice. The family can identify the needs that they're looking for. Um, we kind of center it around the six dimensions of well-being, whether or not that be health resources, educational resources, economic stability. It really is um, kind of dependent on the family. We don't tell them what services they need. We help identify them for the family so that they're familiar with where they go. Um, I kind of want to share a little bit of one of the families that we assisted. She came to the Whole Child Program. Um, her name is Maria, and when she first came to us, she had recently taken in three of her nieces. She already had two boys of her own. Um, her, her siblings had to leave back to their home country, and now she had three girls. She was only used to having to, you know, um, provide services for her two boys, which were um, three and five. Having to provide for three teenagers was completely different. Um, when she came on board with us, she had already been doing her application assistance with the Whole Child Connection Program, um, but then she came in and she said, I need help. It's the holidays. Um, she had already missed the online registration for Salvation Army and the Angel Tree Program. Um, thankfully, through Treasure Coast Food Bank, we actually had some electronics. We were able to supply her with holiday food assistance. We were able to provide um, the girls and her boys um, with some toys for the holiday season, which can seem minor, um, but when you're financially already struggling to support two, two kids and now you go from a household of three to, <laughs> to kind of increasing it to a household of eight, it just makes it really difficult on the family. Um, but we were also able to connect her to our teen pantry program and provide her other resources for the girls, um, including therapy, because it was a little bit um, of a difficult shift. But without our community partners and all the programs that we have listed within the whole child system, that wouldn't have been possible. While we can't provide financial assistance, we can still provide those resources and information so that they can still financially be able to support their family. Um, we got the girls free dental treatment um, through Little Lights Dentistry um, until their Medicaid came in because we did have to do that direct application assistance. Um, her story also kind of takes us into the summer. Um, her benefits lapsed. And it was one of those things where she hadn't necessarily used a lot of the food pantries that were in the area. We reminded her of the availability. It was back to school time. She needed help with you know, school supplies, um, backpacks for the children. And we were also a summer break spot um, out of our whole child connection office off of Dixie Highway. And she came in Monday through Friday for about uh, two weeks until her benefits for her food assistance um, reappeared on her card and she was deemed eligible again. Um, but she really struggled during that time and that's the purpose of a program like ours. Families come in and they share with us sometimes their biggest struggles and we're there for them without them having to, you know, feel like they're a burden, that they're asking for something. Um, our largest source of referrals um, is really word of mouth. Um, a lot of the families that come to us come to us because they, 
they heard of, you know, their friend, their family member, um, or they just moved into a neighborhood and they said, hey, where do you go to for help? Um, as much as we rely on referrals from our families, it's really the trust that we've built in the community um, that really is kind of a testament to the work that we're able to do. Um, but again, those dental referrals, <laughs> the food pantries, we still also heavily rely on our partners to be able to refer out. And sometimes that's the biggest barrier for our families. They might just not be familiar with the services that are available in the community and having an in-person um, you know, resource um, center that they can go to really makes an impact on what they're going to be able to provide to their family. Some of the other um, partnerships that I want to talk about are our public partnerships. Um, as much as we focus on case management, we are also um, community partners with the state through Florida Department of Children and Families to be able to do out direct application assistance for Medicaid, SNAP, cash assistance, and then also Florida Kid Care. So those are some of the direct um, services that we do provide. And the, what that looks like is essentially coaching them on what the requirements are. A lot of the families, um, adults or seniors that we service, they're income eligible. They're not coming to apply because you know, it's something that they heard about. They're coming because it's a need for them. But just because they're income eligible doesn't mean they can apply and get approved. It is a very complicated system. Um, unfortunately, we have many individuals that did not submit an application with us. Even though they qualified, they failed to receive their benefits because A, they weren't aware they had to do a phone interview. They thought they submitted their income documents and um, unfortunately, once the end of that application period is over, they have to reapply and they only have 30 days to complete the application process. And somebody that is in urgent need of food assistance or health insurance coverage for their child or for themselves through Medicaid, they don't have another 30 days. That cycle now gets extended to 60 days. So one of the benefits um, of our programs through Whole Child Connection and the Your Plate office is we let them know. We don't let them come in, submit an application, and just send them out the door. We really take our time to educate them on what the application process looks like and remind them there are going to be you know, certain deadlines that they have to meet. And with that, we have, um, we've recently started tracking just the SNAP approval rating and we're between 86 to 90% approval rating because we are doing that, you know, that portion for them where we're telling them, you know, these are the deadlines, this is what you can expect. But we also, we fax their documents. They can come in with, you know, again, to fax, make photocopies of their income documents. We help them download their pay stubs. We take time with them. They know that they're not a burden on us when they come in, that we're genuinely just here to help. And um, it's wonderful because we get a lot of referrals from community partners that also recognize that, um, you know, coming to us is different than going to, let's say, one of the state-funded access centers where, they have to do it on their own, and that's it. If they have any questions, unfortunately, they don't step in and help give them too much guidance. Um, if anyone has been familiar with that, it's just kind of in and out, and there's you know maybe one or two staff members for any 20 people, and then just a computer, and language barrier is a really big thing with that. Um, thankfully, we offer our services in English, Spanish, and Creole um, through one of our um, benefits outreach specialists. And in being able to do that, we really kind of increase um, the number of individuals that we can service. We did almost between both offices just about 2,000 Medicaid applications this past year, over 3,000 SNAP applications. Um, and that's not even the number of individuals, that's just the household um, for the application. And with an approval rating of 86% um, and higher, you can just imagine the um, number of families that we really kind of can give an impact to in the community. And it's one of those things where 
we know we make a difference when we have somebody that comes in and they've been struggling when they've done it on their own and then they come in and they, they realize how easy it really was. They just didn't understand fully what it kind of took to complete the application process. Um, so that's where, you know, having somebody, um, an organization like ours, your whole child or your plate, it really kind of makes a difference in the community and, and just kind of the resources that it opens up for them. One of the other points that I wanted to touch on is just kind of our resource and referral. Um, a lot of our community partners are familiar with the work that we do and we can't do it alone. Um, as much as we would love to be everything for our families and provide every service, we do rely on our referrals to um, some of, this is not all of them, but this, these are um, a large number of the community agencies that we partner with. And again, it could be A through Z, mental health services, um, after school care services, early learning coalition for daycare um, assistance, and one of the ways that we get a lot of this information out is we all collaborate together. If you're a nonprofit in the room, you kind of understand the partnership aspect of, you know, we, we attend community meetings, um, we keep each other informed, you know, via um, either like the Children's Health Improvement Council, um, the COSA meetings, interagency coalitions, outreach fairs, and that's important for the work that we do because the more we know about what everyone else is doing, the more families we can affect. Our goal isn't just to take everybody, our goal is to increase the number of referrals um, that we send out to community organizations between both of our offices, the Whole Child and Your Plate office. Um, through our outreach services alone, we reached over 20,000 individuals in the past year. And those are some of our updated numbers. And with that work, we're also spreading, you know, a lot of information about what else is available out, you know, out there in the community, but because they're hearing it from us, an organization that they also trust, and they're kind of, you know, describing some more intimate details about what's going on in their household, they trust that when they go to your organization, that you're also going to be able to help them. Because sometimes the biggest barrier is, is fear. It, they, they might want the help, but they don't know what it's going to look like when they get to your organization. That's some of the work that we do. We let them know when you call this organization, this is the type of information they're going to ask you for. Um, another question might be, are they gonna understand me? If they speak Spanish or Creole, do they have you know, those services available on staff? And then thankfully through our um, whole child site, we can normally let them know and say, yes, they do have, you know, a Spanish speaker, this is the extension, this is the person, a point of contact, this is what receiving the services look like, this is what the wait time looks like, and we can give them a realistic overview um, of what, you know, your organization requires of them to receive services. Um, that way it's not just a cold handoff where we say, okay, here's a paper, call them, no that doesn't tend to work. Most of the times the families want to know, okay, but can I just show up? Do I make an appointment? Um, what's the best way to actually connect to a community partner? And because of all the close relationships that we have, we can answer that question 90% of the time. And if we can't, we pick up the phone in office, give them a phone call and say, okay, I'm going to help you. I've made phone calls with our families to a number of these community um, organizations to just allow them to, you know, make an appointment um, for a call back if that's what's needed or to do the screening to start receiving services. And then this is just a couple of the thank you notes. Um, Corbin was so kind to mention that we do run a teen pantry out of our office. Um, and we also allow for in-person walk-ins for this, um, but we use an online registration through Ticket Leap. So we do customize it and we can customize bags for the teens that come into our office. That way we can kind of give them a choice. And one of my favorite things to mention is um, our boys, our teen boys that will register online, they love to mention that they want acne products, face wash, all of those um, you know, non-food essential items that, again, SNAP benefits don't cover. Um, 
because it's something they don't have to ask mom or dad for, and they know that they're welcome to come in and they're gonna get a full-sized item. Um, I always like to point that out because it's, they're not coming in and getting like a small travel item. Um, it's their full-sized bars of soap, body wash, shampoo, toothpaste. Um, acne products when we get them in. We will um, do our best to fulfill those requests. It is by donation. Um, but a lot of the teens in, that come in or the families that come in to pick up the items are really grateful. Um, they acknowledge that it makes a big difference um, to them as far as their household budget because sometimes it's just not in the budget um, to be able to do that. But, you know, certain essentials like um, you know, bars of soap, toothpaste, body wash, those things are, especially deodorant, are important to teens. And they feel like they come into our office and they do their own shopping. Um, a lot of our community partners love to um, send their, any families that might not be familiar with our teen pantry into our office and it kind of opens the door for them to find out about a lot of the other agencies that we work with because we always try and have information out on the table, especially on our teen pantry days um, for any specific um, programs that might target teens in terms of, you know, after school programs, volunteer opportunities. Um, any resource fairs that are for teens, and they look forward to that. They'll come in, they'll take a look um, at our table that we have um, out during those days, and they see what information they can pick up. Um, we've put scholarship opportunity information in their bags before, and it's really a moment that's about them to be able to come into our office. So we're really happy that we get to service the families, but we also get to directly impact um, some of the children that are in their households. Thank you so much, Ruby. That was great. All right. And at this time, we'd like to open the floor for questions. If you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll bring the mic over to you. Anybody have any questions? No? Well, just so you guys know, if any questions arise, feel free to raise your hand. But we do have some contact information over here, along with a QR code that goes directly to our partnership application. Um, in that process, if you have any questions, all of the emails for the folks that Krista introduced earlier are on that sheet for you. Um, and I know we're a little over time, so I don't want to hold you guys too long, but thank you so much for coming. Our next meeting will be um, in January, so take a look or keep a look out for that. Um, we'll be sending you guys an email with some information. Yes, sir. Uh, my name's Stan North. I'm um, on the HOA board for uh, one of the HOAs at PGA Verano. And we don't, uh, you wouldn't, it's a gated 55-plus uh, community. You wouldn't think we have, uh, I'm not here because of our needs. I'm here because of our resources. Uh, we maybe have 3,000 retired individuals who speak a range of languages, who are chefs, uh, retired chefs, retired food handlers. Uh, uh, I participated uh, two or three weeks ago for three hours here at this warehouse packing. Um, you know, we brought 20 people with us and uh, there were 30 people here already, so the 50 of us roughly packed 2,000 boxes for your handouts. Very fulfilling work. Um, uh, added years to my life, uh, so to speak. So I want to explore with you at your convenience how we could employ resources uh, if you needed 50 people to show up every month at a packing or you needed uh, trained food handlers as a resource in case of a, a hurricane that strikes through and, and uh, your, your normal staff can't make it. We could, we could be on the bench, so to speak, our ideas to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are always looking for folks to partner, and that includes volunteering opportunities. I think uh, Corbin mentioned we have a production kitchen, so there are opportunities. If you have any food service workers that like to come and volunteer, we're always looking for volunteers, especially with the hurricane that we 
just experienced, uh, we were doing a lot of prepared meals for the community and can use all the help that we can get. On our website, stophunger.org, um, one of the tabs says how to get involved, ways to get involved, and all of our opportunities to get involved are listed there. On our contact sheets over here as well, feel free to reach out to any of us. If you think you have a talent or a trait that you'd like to donate that your time to the food bank, uh, we'd love to put you to work. So <laughs> just let us know. Um, anybody else have any questions? No? All right. Well, thank you so much. Feel free to grab some fruit or muffins on your way out or some coffee. Otherwise, we're going to have to eat them all, and we don't need more muffins. <laughs> have a great weekend, everyone.